tonight we're going to be looking at the archaeology history of Cymru and all of those locations reveal a secret for us and those secrets will be metalwork we're going to look at some wonderful metalwork from our wonderful land um, and Bill mentioned last week a place known as Fleen Vaur and I quickly told Bill to shut up uh, because <laughs> some of the finds at Clean Vaur we'll be looking at today. I, I did enjoy last week after um, things managed to get going um, when we were looking at lakes. So um, actually let's not move on from here too soon. Most of the stuff that we'll be looking at today is actually um, Bronze Age or Iron Age and just to please those that like the Romans we've got a Roman artifact that I've never seen before. In fact most of the artifacts that we're looking at today I've never seen before. I'll tell you the ones that I knew about before and I've seen and experienced and then we will have a good little bit of a journey together with artifacts that, that are new to me. So that'll be good. So we go into Anglesey, North Wales um, and South Wales as well as you can see on the map. So the first thing that we're going to actually look at is this behind me, it's the Mold Cape. Now, I've actually seen the replica of the Mole Cape, and I've actually seen the real, real Mole Cape. Uh, and there's lots of arguments over why is the Mole Cape um, in the British Museum. And on this one, the Mole Cape should be in the British Museum. Uh, it, it's, it's gold, it's a security risk, and it's safe in the British Museum. And it, it's lots more people see the Mole Cape, but let's not talk about the politics. I've got some nice information that we're going to look at. This, this is the typical one. This is the image that you will see about the Mole Cape. This is the one. Um, and this is the one that the British Museum issue. Um, you'll see this on postcards. You'll see this in books. Um, you'll see this all over the place. Um, and the Mole Cape itself. Wow. Uh, yeah, wow, exactly. Yes. Mm, um, the, the mold cape itself, what we're going to do, we're going to stream through a few images. And um, that is the mold cape being worn by somebody. And there you go. It's not exactly big. Right. So um, it's, it's a, it'll probably fit on my shoulders and Bill's <laughs> um, and even Stav's shoulders. Um, Could it be heavy, Carl? What's that lovely? How heavy? Would it be heavy? Ah, we're going to look at all those facts and figures. So ah, Rosamond. Great, great. Shh. Oh, shut up. <laughs> okay. Exactly. Um, so what we're going to do, um, I'm going to, I've got some nice stuff. And if I put you down the side, I've got all those facts and figures answered in front of me. So um, the mold cape itself is an in intriguing object. It's, it's gold, that, that's, that's fact one. Um, it's a solid um, um, sheet of gold. Um, and it's, it's basically the, those raised areas, uh, they've used a little wooden tool, um, not an iron tool, Bill, because this is found in the Bronze Age. Uh, they're using a little mud, wooden tool to actually get the indentations in there and the raised relief surface. So that's what we're looking at. Um, it was found in Flint in 1833. So the replica is actually in the Mold Museum. Um, it's a very, very small museum. Um, and some say it was for ceremonial purposes. The gold cape itself was actually found by workmen. Um, and there's some intriguing stories associated with it. Um, and there's a ghost associated with it as well. Um, and may, maybe that ghost story might be for another day because I've got a lot of things to actually go through here. Um, but it, it's, the cape was um, within um, a Bronze Age burial mound, not a massively impressive Bronze Age burial mound, but it was a mound known as Goblin's Hill. So it builds up that sense. Now, when we think about these types of objects made of gold, they are very rare in archaeology indeed. Archaeologists very rarely ever find gold. I found gold, but Michelle can't be classed as a gold nugget. The gold cape had been placed on the body of a person who was interred in a Bronze Age burial mound. It wasn't the greatest Bronze Age burial ground, 
uh, burial mound. It wasn't the greatest monument. So finding this object in there um, is a discovery in itself. It was found by workmen. Um, and initially, um, the workmen broke it up until somebody got on to the fact that this was a major discovery. This was made in 1833. To give you an idea, uh, the breadth from shoulder to shoulder um, is 458 millimeters. So in other words, just under half a, a meter um, in sort of a breadth, sort of running um, from one shoulder to the next. Um, it was designed to fit somebody of a very slim build, i.e. myself or Bill. Um, and although the gender of the person buried in, in this grave remains unclear, the associated finds are likely by comparison with similar contemporary graves to be those that may have been buried with a woman, but we are not sure. The problem is when this, when this was actually found, uh, the individuals who found it weren't archeologists. Um, and obviously, you know, li listen to this. Since um, the, the, it, was, it was a very fragile cape, um, and it was broken up when it was discovered. And the pieces were dispersed amongst people. You can imagine, it, they, they, it's dispersed. The typical thing that's gonna happen with an object at this stage. Um, and when, when the, the British Museum um, got to hear about this, they sent people out there to actually gather all the bits of gold together. However, not all of the bits of gold were actually found. Small fragments have come to light intermittently over the years and have been reunited with the larger portion. Little bits remained on the site as well. So, you know, they've been found over the years. So what we do see is a restoration and it's likely, we don't really know what it looked like when it was discovered um, because, you know, there would be descriptions that it was, it was squashed down uh, there would be descriptions that uh, maybe it was very similar to the way you're looking at it today. Um, and it's basically, it looks at being something. Um, there's no parallels to this. However, I do know a little bit about this. There has been another one found, um, but that's more or less been completely lost. Um, and it's, it's also thought as well that there was actually a bronze um, a bronze undergarment for this as well. There's so much to look at this one, um, but there are very few parallels in a sense in regards to this. Um, it, it's it's going to be very close to um, it's going to be very close to the the gold mines of the west of of Cymru. I mean, it's likely it may have been made um, by those metal workers associated with the copper mines at the Great Orm at Landudno. Um, and the, the design, the designs that you actually see, the decorative motive designs that you actually see, um, the various different bands, various different sequences of decorations, there's various rows. Uh, if, if it's sort of saying um, uh, rows of dome bosses, ridges, conical bosses, various other levels of design on here. We could go on about this all night. Um, it's it's very likely um, it's very likely that um, under this there may have actually been as I said there was evidence that under this there may have been a bronze kind of undergarment and that was on top of a leather garment as well um, but it's been very difficult to understand this is the problem when you find objects out of context they've been taken from a burial and and they've been dispersed and then somebody comes in and tries to reconstruct the the story. Um, this type of archaeology is when we find something like this, this is the whole point of doing my course tomorrow, actually, to try to understand how archaeologists work and do things. Um, when you've got an object like this, say this was found by an archaeologist today, um, we would get a little bit more of a picture than the picture that they developed in 1833. In 1833, the bones were dispersed, the bronze objects were dispersed, any evidence that the leather was dispersed, how it was found was dis dispersed and so on. So it's very important that when anything like this is found, it's left in the ground. So because, because, we've, got, because we've got lots of um, artifacts to look at tonight, 
I would implore you to actually, when you go to the British Museum, actually see this object. It's well worth seeing it. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna get a back to this again. And in, in lots of ways, when you look at an object like this, it's, it's lost its context. Um, in, the problem is when things like this are displayed in museums, they, they get lost amongst all the other paraphernalia. But one museum that's actually doing things differently is actually um, uh, this, the, the Folk Museum at St. Fagans. Um, and the way they're doing thing, different things differently at the Folk Museum at St. Fagans, the, the great artifacts from Cymru are actually being uh, displayed with a lot of room around them and you're able to appreciate them. Uh, but th th this isn't in the uh, Welsh Folk Museum. And again, um, you know, you're getting an idea of um, this individual. And to, to say something as well, you know that little beaker that um, the individual's holding? Uh, we've, we've got um, a couple of um, golden beakers like that that have actually been found about that scale. Gold beakers. Uh, one from actually Cornwall, actually. But we're, those are not objects from our land, so we will, we'll pass on that one. And again, give you an idea of scale as well. So this is one that I have actually seen. I've actually seen this in the flesh. Now, this again loses its context. Um, when I, to me anyway, because the last time I saw it was in the National Museum of Wales. It was upstairs. Um, all the cabinets were dark. It was like a weird little, it's a fire dog actually. Um, and there it is. And basically, this is actually found at Capel Garman in Conway. Capel Garman in Conway. Um, and this is, um, this is pride in place um, on, on display in the National Museum of Wales. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure where it is in St. Fagans at this minute, but you can actually see the original. Um, and let's look at a little bit more detail and, and let's see what, okay, before I look, look a little bit more detail, let's see what this fire dog actually looked like. There you go. Usually two fire dogs. Um, and this is what we're talking about. And usually the fire dog itself uh, would support, um, there'd be two of these and between them, there would be um, an iron frame between the two, the two fire dogs. Um, and then you would be able to put logs on there. And then if you want to go to the reconstruction, there you go. There's a reconstruction. This is a reconstruction at um, Casteth Hen Lease. If anyone gets an opportunity to see this, you can see how the fire dog actually works. This one doesn't have any sense of iron, connect, iron connections between them. Uh, but on this one, it sort of does. So this is how a fire dog actually works. Um, and, you know, uh, the name dog, you know, they, they might be shown to be dogs. You could handle, hang different things from them. So if we go back to um, our illustration, let's tell you a little bit more about it. Um, which is always the best thing to do. Capel Garman fire dog. Um, and this object itself, um, again, this object wasn't found now, like the object found at Mould in 1833. This was found in 1852. Um, and again, this was found by a worker. Um, a farm worker discovered this art artifact in 1852 at Carreg Caidiog Farm, Capel Garman, Tranchrust, uh, Conway. Um, it was found lying on its side with a large stone placed each end and deeply buried in peat. So it was deliberately buried. Okay, the other object was deliberately buried, but that was in a burial context. This is deliberately buried in its own context. It's placing an unbroken state, suggests that it was deliberately, it was a deliberate deposit. Um, was this possibly an offering to one of the gods? Um, there was a strong tradition of votive metalwork deposition within lakes, bogs and rivers in Wales. And we've got two examples of that, haven't we, Bill, tonight? Fire dogs perhaps paired, as I've mentioned, would have been placed either side of the central hearth within the roundhouse. And this, this to me is a weird dichotomy. You've got these, these fire dogs in the middle of um, 
an organic roundhouse. Um, and why it's a dichotomy, something like this is really well made and a roundhouse is common or garden roundhouse. We'll move on from that. I, I was trying to say something there, if you could see it. Their function could have been decorative, <laughs> symbolizing the status of the household. At either end of the fire dog is a representation of an animal's uh, head and neck. Uh, it represents that of a horse or a bull. Again, um, the representation of um, the horse, a ponus, a ponus, um, um, a pona, um, is very important to our ancestors. Now, okay, before anyone jumps in there, it dates from <coughs> the beginning of the Iron Age. Now, I, the understood period of the start of the Iron Age is roughly around 750 years BC. That's when the Iron Age began. Um, it's an iron object. Does it represent a mythical beast? Uh, the blacksmith who made this fire dog was a master crafts person. I don't doubt it. The mold cape was created by a master crafts person as well. Highly skilled in shaping and working iron. Now there's an interesting problem here. This is so well made. As it's so well made, was it not made later in the Iron Age than the early part of the Iron Age? Because if Iron Age is, is iron being introduced, it's not going to be made at the beginning of the Iron Age, around 750 years BC, because they're only starting to work iron at the beginning of the Iron Age. And this is a big <laughs> chunk of metal. When we look at the development of technology, you start off with something small. Okay, you start off with a bicycle, you work to um, a car, and you work that to a Land Rover, and you work up to a van, that type of thing. So I would say it's a little bit later in the Iron Age than the earlier date that's in front of me. The skill of the blacksmith was highly respected within the community. The blacksmith was usually seen as the person in the village, more important than anybody else, because a blacksmith could create, some, uh, could create iron from a stone. Hence, um, drawing a sword out of a stone. The sword in the stone, that's where the idea of the sword in the stone comes from when we look at um, King Arthur. Iron was then a new material, first used in Wales, um, as we said at that date, 750 years BC. Iron was a valuable material to Iron Age people, involving much effort and hard work to create. I gotta be honest with you, it still does today. So let's um, think of that. Such is the intricacy of the Kapil Gar Garman fire dog, <laughs> that it would have taken over a year to make from the smelting of iron to the finished piece. Would it have taken a year? I, I, I'm struggling to try and understand that concept. But because they're working in iron um, in a period um, that furnaces would be, it'd be very difficult to get up the required temperature. Maybe there's something in that. Um, it is difficult to know how precisely old the fire dog is by, by what I've already said. Um, it's, it was over a meter in length um, it's, um, here we go, 756 millimeters in height, 75 centimeters in height, under a meter, and weighs over nine kilograms. So it's, it's not massively heavy, but it is a, it's a lot of iron, basically. Um, and when you think about it, when, when you link this in with um, North Wales, you've got the copper mines at Great Orm, Land no, and then you've got um, our uh, mold cape as well, and, and then you've got this later on as well. Um, its discovery in, the, um, in 1852 uh, denied a careful investigation of the burial place. So it could be likely that there's another one lying there somewhere, or one was taken away and melted down. Comparison of this fire dog with others found in, in chieftain burials in England suggests it might not be um, from even um, 200 years BC. It might actually be from um, just after the years of the birth of Jesus Christ. Not sure. These chieftain burials, um, if this was of later date, may have included amphora, which had been imported into the country from the continent. Uh, Wheel-made pottery. Yeah, thinking about that, wheel-made pottery. Pottery in the Iron Age 
up to that point was actually made by hand. So let's look a little bit more of these images. Um, there we go. And again, getting an idea of how this worked. Um, and, you know, maybe I'm being a bit derogatory of the, these circular roundhouses, um, being that I've actually lived in a roundhouse and I think roundhouses are wonderful places to live. Um, but what I'm trying to get at is that the technology used for this, you start to think, well, why didn't they use similar technology to build greater and more impressive homes? But we'll leave that there. Again, a bit of the detail. This, is this a mythical beast? It looks more like a little bit of a mythical beast. And it's likely as well that there may have been um, some, some trailed um, glass paste on this as well to sort of bring out some of the features. But then again, with the heat that may have melted, I don't know. So yeah. there could have been more detail associated with this. <coughs> Next, Bill. Where is I know. This? Carry on. <laughs> Go on. Tell us the location. Go on. This is at the foot of the Bulk Mountain, just a couple of miles from Triochi, in a natural sort of uh, amphitheater, in a wonderful location, in fact. That was found there some years back, along with other iron artifacts. And you I think to... now all, all in the museum in Cardiff, Carl? I, yeah, St. Fagans, I think they are. This is the um, Clin Vauer Horde. Um, you know, the problem is having... That was a really good introduction there, Bill. The problem is when you've got subjects and then somebody pounces in there like you did last week, Bill, you said, what about the horde? And I said, please don't tell people about that one. Um, but um, I love this because it's, I think I've seen this, but I'm not exactly sure because I, I, I know I've seen the fire dog. I know I've, I've seen that. Um, there it is, Klinbauer. Um, it's very near me. It's at the top of, it's at the top of my valley, actually. Um, and it's, it's very near another site um, um, known as Blind Ronda, but they, there it is there. And what we're going to do, I, I've got a nice little description. There's, that's how it was, used to be displayed at the National Museum of Wales. It's displayed a little bit better than that now, but what we've got, we've got some little miniature scythes here on the left. We've got some um, shield bosses. We've got um, socketed arrowheads. We got socketed axes. Um, this is all wonderful archaeology. And I've got a nice little description of this as well. Look at all these little bits here. Um, but we've gone a bit too far a minute. That's another site. So what we'd like to do is look at this and let's because all the other objects were actually found within it. That that's that's the point I need to make. So do you know what, right? I, I, I've got a confession to make. When I was preparing this lecture, I thought, oh, God, I'm not going to find enough material to, um, um, to actually tell you about. I'm not, I'm not going to find the information that I need. Um, but luckily enough, I have. So lots of this is thanks to the National Museum of Wales. Now, when was this found? This wasn't found in 1800. This was found in 1913, which is good as over 200 years, over 100 years ago, 100 years. Uh, this cauldron was discovered in 1913, buried in peat, mm -hmm. at the bottom of the lake, a clean vower, a uh, chrigos from, um, from the Kalantach. The discovery by workmen was made as peat was being removed from the drained lake in order to deepen it for its use as a reservoir. Um, and you, when you looked at the image earlier on, the, the back bit was, is natural, but at the front, they reservoired it. The lean bower hoard includes a number of chisels, sickles, um, socketed axes, a sword, pitcher Lloyd George, a spearhead, a razor, and a horse harness equipment. Now, this comes from an interesting period. This comes from, um, it's a, um, you've, you've got various bronze and iron objects there. Uh, this wonderful uh, bronze uh, cauldron but there are iron objects there. So it, it comes from the beginning of the um, Iron Age, 750, at the end of the Bronze Age. So that's sort of transitional period. And this is another point. They didn't stop using bronze in the Iron Age. Um, they used bronze in the Iron Age extensively, but it's when at the beginning of the Iron Age, iron was first being used 
and smelted in a British context. And before you start going on about pyramids, Bill, stop. Cauldrons were used for cooking food, especially during feasts. They were also regarded as ceremonial possessions, invested with symbolic powers of regenera regeneration and fertility. Um, well, basically, that's a good one. Michelle, go and cook the dinner. That's a sign of fertility. This cauldron is made of bronze ham hammered out into four flat sheets with a circular base piece. Um, and they all joined with bossed and bronze rivets, as you can see there. So basically, they're bossed in the front um, and they're riveted over at the back. The cauldron could be suspended by means of a pair of circular handles. These artifacts were buried in, in a complete in a complete rather than a broken state. Lots of objects that we see in lakes and water courses across Britain around this time have been deliberately broken. Um, look at the work of Francis Pryor, he, he will tell you all about it. And many were items of, of the highest quality, some of which originated in other parts of Britain and the continent and traded on. Could this material have been a gift to the deities of the underworld? The sister lake associated with Llyn Vaur itself has those associated with the underworld. The reflective lake waters may have been seen as a boundary between two worlds. The Llyn Vaur hoard is extremely important because it illustrates the crossover between the Bronze and the Iron Ages. It is usually because of the mixed types of objects that suggest a wide range of origins. Indeed, on the British scale, the name Clean Vaur is given to the period of time um, um, dating specifically to this period when there's a lot of exchange of iron and bronze goods. Our bronze is going one way and iron's going the other, and mixed hoards like this. Some of the earliest iron objects made in Britain are included in this hoard. So, in other words, this worker of the items associated with this bronze cauldron would have been the earliest workers working in iron. Um, that's an important point. So this person, I, I'd like to think that the iron objects were some of the first iron objects being produced in Britain around 750, 700 years BC, made by the same person who made this bronze cauldron. That's an interesting um, conundrum really. It's an interesting area. We do not know where the iron was being mined or smelted. A local source of ore is possible. Well, I would think that, you know. The Lynn Bauer cauldron is so big that you can't get your arms around it. It measures 352 millimeters in height and the metal is one to two millimeters in thickness and it weighs a whopping um, seven and a half kilograms, um, 7,580 grams. So it's, it's a chunky cauldron. With liquid in it, right, you can imagine it would be basically immovable. And, and when you think about it, you would have added the liquid after it had been erected above the fire. And then obviously you would have put the liquid in there and all the ingredients and then you scooped it out. Um, and then it, you would be able to move it. That's probably what, what's basically happening. So the next, the next object that we're going to look at, um, there's some really weird things about this one. Um, and it's really weird because it, it comes to that period, um, another interchange period between the Iron Age and the Roman period. Um, and an iron sword, um, um, a crescentric shaped plaque, like the types of ones that officers used to wear in the Napoleonic War, but this is a little bit before that. Blacksmith's tongs, a chariot tire, sickle, and a slave chain. There's an Elvis Presley song in there, but I'm not going to sing it. Lynn Kerrigbach, there you go. Another wonderful site, and I need to show you where this is. Um, so, Let's go Lynn Kerrigbach. Um, hang on, we've, we've still on this. Um, there it is on Anglesey. 
we've gone to Anglesey now, Clinkerig Bach. Um, so you've got another lake there. So again, there's a lake link. There it is. Um, it looks very sort of, if you take away the sort of um, the design there, uh, you know, officers used to wear the type, these types of things, made <coughs> bronze in the Napoleonic War. Um, there you go. There's all the objects. There's basically very narrow necks, those, um, and some nice swords, bent swords. Um, and look at this. Here we go. Um, this is associated with the archaeologist um, um, Cyril Fox. Um, arrives to direct the archaeological excavations and writes a book about the discoveries. So you've got part of a chariot, bronze decoration, piece of a cooking pot, spearhead, sickle blade, part of a trumpet. Can I actually go off on a little bit of a tangent? Um, there was this archaeologist that used to come to um, my Bridgen classes years ago. I don't know if Pat remembers him. He was a metal detector enthusiast. And he used to li bring li little bits of, bits of iron along and little bits of bronze along. Um, and I said, please, please don't throw these away. He said, why? And I said, these could actually be bits of um, iron cauldrons and bronze cauldrons. So we actually collected a few bits and pieces. Over the next four years, with Mr. Robert's help, more than 150 objects made of bronze and iron are recovered from the peat, along with many more fragments of wood and bone. And again, what a wonderful discovery. What a wonderful find. So let's put these up here. Let's see what we can discover in my lovely notes. Thanks to the NASA Museum of Wales at St. Fagans. Um, so St. Fagans, these are at St. Fagans. The Klim Kerig Bach hoard comprises over 150 objects of bronze and iron. You could think there's a little bit, little bit of an interchange period, but there's not. This is actually the interchange period, not between the Bronze and the Iron Age, but the period between the Iron and the Roman period. They were found at the time um, of the Second World War, um, during the construction of RAF, um, RAF um, airfield at Valley Anglesey. Workmen discovered these objects while digging peat from the site of a former lake edge. And, you, and just imagine, this is one of probably the only, this is one of probably the only archaeological excavations at a military base permitted at the time of the war. And this is, this is great that this happened. Directed by the great archaeologist Cyril Fox, um, um, who, was, who was a great excavator in Wales. He, he, lots of contributions to the National Museum of Wales and, and, his, and, his, and, his, and his knowledge. The collection includes seven, seven swords, not two, seven, and six spearheads, fragments of a shield, part of a, tr a bronze trumpet. Oh, don't get me blowing my trumpet. Two gang chains, fragments of iron wagon tires and horse gear. My God, it's all there. This is a quite a dichotomy. This is not a dichotomy. It's a microcosm of, of life back then. This has got a bit of everything. In addition, blacksmith's tool, tools, tools, fragments of two cauldrons, Iron bars for trading and animal bones were also found and other objects. The range and side, size of the clean Kerrig bar collection is of great importance to our understanding of the Iron Age weaponry, metalworking tools and the development of art styles. This collection is comparable with the famous discovery of metalwork in Switzerland at a site known as Laten. You, you've probably heard of the Laten culture. The collection of valuable metal objects is interpreted as an offering to the gods or goddesses. Such votive offerings are part of a long tradition in the Bronze and Iron Age in Wales. So here we go. Uh, this is the only mention of Druids written down by the Romans in Britain. So we're going to do the full thing. Um, the Roman historian Tacitus describes Anglesey as a center of druidical learning at the time of the Roman conquest of Anglesey in about AD 60. Uh, with the legions active in Anglesey, it led to um, uh, the Iceni rebellion led by uh, uh, Boudicca um, around this time, AD 60, AD 61. The druids are described as religious leaders, the priestly class of the Celtic Iron Age. Uh, Tacitus tells us that their sacred groves were destroyed at the time of the conquest. So I'm going to read this one out. 
Um, and and then, then what we will do is look a little bit more. Um, at that time, however, uh, Paulina, um, Paulinus Suetonius was in charge of Britain. In military science and people's talk, which allow, allows no one to be without envy, um, he rivaled Corbulo and was anxious to equal the glorious recovery of Armenia by subduing enemies of the state. For this reason, he prepared to attack the island of Mona, which had a large population and provided shelter for fugitives um, hiding from the Roman <laughs> occupation. Flat bottom boats were constructed to contend with the shallow waters and shifting bottom. And in this way, the infantry made the crossing, then followed the cavalry, making use of fords or swimming beside their horses where the water was deeper. Along the shore stood the enemy in close packed array of armed men interspersed with warrior women, like furies in funeral black, with streaming red hair and brandishing torches. Round about were the Druids, their hands raised to heaven, pouring out dire curses. The Roman troops were so struck with dismay at this weird sight that they became routed to the spot as though their limbs were paralyzed and laid themselves open to wounds. Then bolstered by their encouragement of their commander and urging one another not to be afraid of this mass of fanatical women, women who are fanatical, you know what I mean. They advanced with their standards, cut down all they met and enveloped them in flames of their own torches. After this, a garrison was imposed on the conquered natives and the groves uh, devoted to their savage rites cut down, for it was part of their religion to drench their altars with the blood of captives to consult their gods by means of human entrails. Actually, I don't believe most of that, but it's up to you. And finally, about clean um, carried back um, have been a major focus of druidical ritual, question mark. The presence of ob objects such as a trumpet, gang chains and, and so much military equipment suggests that this is not a site solely of local significance. The large numbers of weapons suggest that objects may have been offered here before battle, even before um, um, a Paulinus, a Suetonius Paulinus actually reached the island. Recently, the site has been reassessed involving fieldwork, new illustrations and study of the artifacts and chemical testing of the metalwork rather than represented a single depositional event. It now seems more likely that this was a religious site at which many small deposits were made over a period of time up to 400 years, venting out the difference in style of objects over that time period. So, what do we come on to next? Actually, we come on to some little objects. And here we go. Let's look at, um, let's finish off on these objects from Thin Kerrig back and, and look at these. Um, let's, let's just have a little bit of a look. You know, um, let's not rush this too much tonight. Uh, hopefully, I'll, I'll be able to fit everything in. So, the, the, obviously, these are the, um, the swords. Um, blacksmith's um, tools. Now, what made the archaeologists think that this was made over a period of time uh, is the differences uh, in these chains. Because this chain looks like it's earlier and this looks like it's later. Um, and obviously, um, we've got this gold object that looks clearly Bronze Age or early Iron Age. Um, and then obviously it's likely that this was deposited over that length of time that the archaeologists tell us. And look at that again. I think, I think it's, um, it, it's a great looking golden object. Again, archaeologists never ever find gold, but when it is found, it's definitely something special. Um, and that's the point, really. Um, I underestimate the value of gold in an archaeological context. But I also, I also acknowledge the fact that gold is very, very rare in an archaeological context. So this being found with the bronze and iron objects tells us of the importance of the hoard. And again, another link. 
Yeah, I know we did lakes last week, but obviously these objects being found associated within the lake and around the outside of the lake. And um, Flag Fen Francis Pryor's site uh, near Peterborough, um, you know, what we've got is lots of broken, deliberately broken swords, bent swords um, being placed into lakes. You can clearly see that those swords have been deliberately bent. And look at that again. Again, it, it's, it's, it, that's a reconstruction, but it's obviously a substantial object. Uh, and that would obviously go around the neck and it's, it's in comparison uh, with objects from the West Indies. It's um, obviously from hundreds of years later, this, 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 this is definitely a slave chain. And there it is on display. A absolutely wonderful the way that's actually produced. And the other thing as well is one thing I'm going to say is that we underestimate iron objects from the Iron Age. Um, I've always wanted somebody to find an iron talk. Um, and the reason, yeah, the key reason why I don't make much of gold is because at this time, gold was easy to work. It, it, was, it was very easy to work. Iron wasn't. Iron was a deep skill. Working in gold is a deep skill, but iron is a greater skill. You, you need to spend time um, creating the iron from the stone in the first place. Gold is just lying around. It's in nuggets. So, you know, gold is gold. But you've got to get the iron out of the stone. Um, then, you've got to, um, then, you've got to, then you've got to heat it up to the temperature that you're able to um, smelt this and to be able to place it into a mold. Um, or you're able to hammer it for a long period of time and work it. Um, whilst you're doing all that, you've made loads of golden objects. So, you know, I, I feel that iron is underestimated. And the problem is when, um, this is my, this is a criticism of metal detecting enthusiasts, not all, but when metal detecting enthusiasts find iron objects, they discard them because what, they're, they're, they're in lumps of corrosion and they're difficult to understand and so on and so on. And they're discarded. But they're very important objects. Look at that there. Crescentric plaque, decorative fixture, bronze repo with trisque uh, motive um, in the late Latin um, style. Um, Latin is that place in, um, in Spain, uh, not in Spain, in Switzerland. And what they're saying with um, um, repost, you can have a, um, a sense of a repost paste as well which has been entered in uh, in a trail on here um, if we get something like that in the future i'll be able to show you what i mean and again a, a votive sword an iron sword from the lake as well that's obviously definitely iron age but obviously a beautiful object um, again on display it's, it's great when they get these objects out on display um, now this itself um, we've, we've now moved from our site known as Llyn Cerebach, Llyn Brydroichoch. Um, and I just wanted to just chuck something Viking in here, actually, um, from Llyn Brydroichoch. Anyone who knows Llyn Brydroichoch would know that it's an important Viking site. And these are actually all important Viking weights. Um, so obviously... Um, You've, you've got, um, this is being dipped in gold. Um, these are lead weights. Um, and very plain, crude objects, other than the ones with decoration on. But these are very important objects. Um, to, to a Viking, for example, to be able to weigh silver and various other objects was important to them as traders, because that's what Vikings were. So to be found at Llampra Doigoch um, on Anglesey, finding objects like this is, is definitely something very, very special. And before Pete shouts out, uh, can I look at that, um, that object in the middle um, with gold plates on it? Go on, go on, Pete, shout her out. That's the Celt. <coughs> there you go. But I love these objects. Lampadragoch. What I'd like to do next 
is go to Michelston Super Ely. Not there. Michelston Super Ely. Michelston Super Ely. Now, lots of Bronze Age socketed axes have been found across Wales. In fact, thousands of them. And in lots of them, what we do find is gold objects. And this is no such exception. Gold objects like this, little strips of gold. I just want to show you one example, actually. Um, a few years ago, um, I know a metal detector enthusiast who found one of the socketed axes, a bronze socketed axe, and he found it actually filled with, um, with gold coins. Well, it's a bronze axe. It's found in the Iron Age because they didn't use um, gold coins um, until the Iron Age, about, about um, 50 years BC. Um, so it's an object that's been reused. But obviously, this cites itself nicely um, into that Bronze Age. Um, and this itself has been, was found at Michelston Super Ely. So as I show you that, let's see what the National Museum of Wales tells us again. This is actually known as the Michelston Super Ely Hoard. Um, it's classed as a hoard because gold has been found with it. It was found in March 1987. A small hoard comprised of a ribbon bronze socketed axe, because that's the type, um, an incomplete gold bracelet, and a gold strip fragment. Um, and these date to roughly around a thousand years BC. The find was made in a field under pasture, beneath an old field uh, bank, so probably hence why it was found. Uh, and, interestingly enough, at a depth of half a metre, whatever metal detector he used, right, to be able to detect half a metre, I don't know what he used, but it was obviously, you know, it must have been a really expensive piece of equipment. An archaeological investigation of the fine spot was undertaken, but yielded no further discoveries. Um, and nobody really knows why it was buried. The gold bracelet and strip fragment um, were found carefully inserted into the socketed bronze axe. Um, the bracelet had been folded over three times to fit into the socket. The bracelet is of hammered sheet design and once had foiled ended terminals, a ribbon bracelet type characteristic of Southern Britain. Gold bracelets have been found carefully inserted inside bronze socketed axes on three occasions in Wales. So there's been three others found, which is great. Um, and the other, the Rosette Community Hold. We actually go to Rosette um, near Wrexham, but for another reason. Um, so this was classed as a, um, a hoard, uh, and this is now the possession of the National Museum of Wales. They, they would have had first dibs to buy it, being a, being a hoard as well. And again, hoards are not just, um, you know, coin hoards. They, they, they can be lots of other objects. So the next object, um, the next one I want to look at is Lantrissen Vauer Monmouth. And look at that, another golden object. I said I wasn't too much into gold, but lots of golden objects here tonight. Um, and one gold object amongst a load of bronze objects. Um, again, let's go to where this is. Lantrissen Vauer Monmouthshire. There it is on the map. So looking at that, that, look at all the wonderful objects. Again, because of gold objects being found here, um, this is classed as a hoard as well. Um, so, do you know what? I've got Bill Wynum's book here, which um, he wrote a book about hordes and stuff. I should have actually dug into that tonight, but I'm okay. We've got enough stuff. So um, I think we've actually got one object actually, uh, uh, after this, actually. The Lantrissen Bauer Community Horde. Um, uh, uh, this, this dates um, quite early, actually. This, this dates from around um, 1,400 years um, BC, um, 3,400 years ago comprising um, a minimum of six gold um, objects and bronze items of jewelry, a bronze pile stave and a bronze dagger. The items of jewelry include a decorated gold bracelet fragment, two decorated bronze bracelets, 
um, at least two twisted bronze torques or neck rings and a bronze pin. And this was found in 2013, um, found by metal detector enthusiasts um, under, um, under a field and pasture. The artifacts make up a hoard that was disturbed and scattered by modern plowing. Um, an archaeological investigation of the found spot was undertaken, helping to identify accurate find spots for the objects and locating the hoard in the landscape. This hoard illustrates the wide range of bronze and gold jewellery forms that came from the Bronze Age in Wales, a very exciting period, sometimes termed as an ornament horizon in Britain. So what we're saying, we're talk, sort of talking about in that part of the Bronze Age, around 1,400 years BC, it's a period of ornamentation. They got bronze and they want to make loads of it. Lots of these types of hoards are being found across Somerset, um, Cymru, um, and Sussex, actually, strange low spread locations. The bronze talks are early examples as well of twisted metalwork. We'll have a quick look at that. Um, and later developed into um, the twisted gold talks that we found elsewhere. So we had bronze talks first, and then gold talks that we find from, from the likes of Norfolk and declared as a treasure trove. Wonderful find that. Let's just have a quick look again. Um, so you've got the twisted bronze objects there. It doesn't actually show all the, um, it doesn't actually show all um, the golden objects. But this is a, um, an earlier socketed axe as well. Very different than the socketed axes that we've already seen. Um, and this would be, um, this itself, um, that's one of the mountain rivets as well, um, on a shaft. Um, and again, some wonderful objects again, some, some that's that sort of the horizon of decoration where, where, they, where they're now working in bronze, everyone's doing it more or less, but it would have been a skill. You would have needed a furnace and so on. And this is the final object. It was found in a field in Rosset. Um, there we go, Wrexham. And it's, it's found in a field, there you go, and it's actually a lead bar. So, you know, we've, we've actually covered copper, gold, iron, and now we've got lead. And there was no lead age either. Um, and so what I've got is a nice article of the week, which I'm going to read out to you. Um, haven't done articles of the week really with these evenings, but I'm going to do one tonight. It makes a change. So here we go. Uh, by the way, if anyone asks, um, another very special lecture next week um, that I've got in mind. Local man finds 2,000 year old Roman lead ingot. Well, it's not exactly 2,000 years old, more like 2,900 years old, but I've been a bit pedantic. Um, a Roman lead ingot. And this was reported on the 26th of June, 2020. A Welsh man wielding a metal detector recently discovered a large Roman lead ingot inscribed with Latin writing. Um, the chunk of lead found in a field near a set in, in Wales measures more than a foot and, and a foot and a half in length and weighs almost, wait for it, 140 pounds. After Rob Jones, the local man who unearthed the ingot, notified authorities of his find, officials from Wrexham Museum and Clewyd and Powers Archaeological Trust worked to identify it. The inscription um, appears to mention Marcus Tre Trebellius Maximus, Marcus Trebellius Maximus, who governed Britannia on behalf of the Roman Emperor Nero between um, 63 and 69 AD, suggesting the lead specimen is nearly 2,000 years old. The finder Jones disco discovered a tangible piece of wonderful Roman mining evidence to the picture. Archaeologists have previously identified fewer than 100 ingots of the same type in Roman Britain, lead ingots. Um, going all the way back to AD 43. Lead ore, also called galena, 
often contained silver. The Romans pro prized both gold and silver. Um, extensively for um, ornamental purposes in decorative boxes, wine cups, and other household items, this is how you see gold and silver use, and later on, pipework. <coughs> Roman engineers developed architectural uses um, for roof coverings made of lead. Um, masonry, um, um, gutters um, made of lead, water pipes made of lead, cisterns made for lead, um, and so on and so on. So lead was an important material. Stamped markings and inscriptions like the one that you're looking at now, um, just, um, they were stamped as a standard stamp. So in other words, um, usually at this stage, around this stage, Roman miners were mining the lead. Um, and they would be stamped the name of the governor to give its weight, because this would be transported over to Europe that needed lots of lead um, for the construction of their various cities, as we did as well. Trebellius helped restore stability in Britain after the Boudican, Boudican revolt. Rather than um, uh, what, what we're seeing is that these chunks of lead among, are among the earliest dated inscriptions found in Britain. So there's an inscription on it, so it's a Latin inscription. We don't yet know where this in, ingot has come from, and we will probably never know where the ingot was going. We'll probably be able to work out where it came from because of metallurgical analysis. However, given the fine spots of other ingots from Britain of similar date, it may have been destined for continental Europe, perhaps Rome itself. The object could tell us a great deal about this important period of our past, an important part of Roman Britain as well, a mining area of Britain, North Wales, a period which is still poorly understood, but hopefully more information could be gleaned from other such objects being found. So before we ask questions, um, if it was found that the manufacturer of this um, was um, extracting too much silver out of the lead content, um, they could be executed. Um, the stamp itself uh, gave the standard of the governor. That's why his name is carried on this object. So what I'd like to do, um, and you can clearly see the, um, the this, or, or Caesar, you can see the end bit, Caesar Augustus, um, in the name of Caesar Augustus, um, Nero would be mentioned on there as well. Um, and they, a bit has been taken off it. So this would be absolutely worthless um, because it would need to be melted down to re-give its value. Any, any ingot like this would, that would be traded. They would want to know why a bit had been taken off it. It's worth value when it's melted down. Um, but this is probably why it was discarded. Anyway, uh, what I'd like to do is, you know, we have done, a, we have just done seconds off a whole hour tonight. So I'm going to stop the screen sharing. Um, and Stav has nearly fallen asleep. <laughs> so what I'd like to ask is, um, are there any questions? Yes. Go for it. Can we go? You go for it. Um, as you know, Carl, I'm always interested in how things are made, how things are fabricated, etc. Yeah. And the mechanics of it all. And looking at the the Bronze Age um, access you shown from Michaelstown elsewhere, they were clearly um, cast, uh, in other words, molten uh, bronze it's into mold. So not only was the, the blacksmith a very important person, highly skilled, so was the pattern maker or the mold maker who well, actually formed the mold in a bed of clay for these intricate forms to be, to be formed and made. Some, yeah, you, yeah, you said clay, that's right. Some are actually carved out of stone, but lots of them are made of clay. But the yeah, ones that yeah, survive yeah. are the stone ones. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Now, looking at the, the hoard from uh, Finval, that was so intricate, the change of things, that obviously couldn't have been made in a mold, and that was made by hand, yeah. which means the blacksmith was highly skilled, really highly skilled to do yes. all that, those intricate forms, etc. Yes. So, so the, the, the level of craftsmanship is, is amazing, not only in gold behind you, 
But in the eye, as you say, to form all that, you know. Exactly. So, uh, but the mod, uh, admiration for the uh, for the craft, these early craftsmen. Yeah, really I, I I would completely comp everything that you said. I, I would completely concur with you on that one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, probably still a lot to be found, no doubt. Oh yeah, definitely. But 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 I wanted to basically the lead bar at the end really completed it actually because um, yeah. Yeah. the mines yeah. later would have been handed over to local control. Um, are back to mm -hmm. the copper mines, native control, Roman military control, native control. That's really important. Um, and yeah, obviously, yeah. the lead bars would have to be stamped by the local mine owner later on. And if he was diddling the state, there you go. Uh, they would have sent the military back in. <coughs> Rosamond, any questions? Quick. I've just a very interesting evening, Carl. I love the fire dog. I thought maybe it could have been a seahorse. Who knows? Exactly, exactly. Um, Right, Pam, quickly. No. No, okay. Um, what about you, Peter? Well, I don't think we've given up them an, enough uh, um, credence for these, the, the skills of these people. Their we skills did, did, must I'm be sorry. absolutely amazing. I, yeah. I, I, and uh, the, their knowledge is not just skill, but a knowledge of uh, uh, geometry and uh, physics as well. Yes. The yeah, mentality I, I, of it all. Yeah, and, yeah, you know, I'm I'm very reminded that this is this is native knowledge. This is native mindsets, um, and you know, I get very angry when people say there were masses of Celts coming over from Europe, when in fact the native peoples uh, are those are very already. people that are creating these. So, um, Goff, anything you'd like to say? The Celts were known to be very, very high skilled craftsmen. Native. The lead bar that the actual uh, um, lettering on it was probably a part of the mold in which it was melted and then poured. Lots of molds going on, you know, highly made molds. Goff, anything you'd like to say? No, no questions. It's very interesting and fascinating. Thank you very much. That was a good one. I've got to be honest with you. Pat? Yeah. No, nothing from you, Pat. Okay. Nothing, the baby. nothing from you, Rosamond, then? I would just to say, Stav and I saw, went, saw some great big chains today, which were probably iron, going up by Asda, anyway. But yeah, just thinking of the craftsmen, like what Peter was just saying. Yes, yes. You know, we've That's lost, right. I feel, a lot of these skills, perhaps. Yeah. Exactly. I, I agree. Um, St Stav, anything you'd like to, a contribution you'd like to make tonight? Uh, Go for no. it. Everyone wants to hear your voice. What about the chase that we saw today, Stav, that you were clam clambering all over? Well, um, we did. The last time I went to those chains was, other than then, was seven years ago, I'm pretty sure. So I was like, yeah. Mm. You could have fitted your head into it and been a slave. Exactly. Possibly, um, actually. What's that? You got your feet in. Possibly. Yeah, I know. Um... So what I'd like to say, um, we've got another corker for next week. Um, obviously, um, we've got, a, I think we've got another two of these lectures and then, then we've got a, a new class starting. Um, I'd look for, looking forward to seeing you, those of you tomorrow. And obviously we've got um, Thursday evening. Um, and again, thank you for you know, joining me tonight. It's been, been really great. So what I'm going to say, Rosamond and uh, Stav stay behind for a couple of minutes at the end, but then I've got a, okay. I've got a dash. If nobody's got anything else to say, Pam, go and say something quick. Okay, quickly. I thought it's fascinating that they had gold in the axe, head, axe heads, and I could think, well, did they wear the axe heads on the belt around their waist? Did they hide that gold deliberately? You know, all sorts of questions on that. So it's more like, what were the people doing? And, and act, actually, th this could have been two lectures today. We could have had one and a half about the skills, which I didn't really do. I'm not going to apologise. I believe I've actually seen the uh, the, the gold um, cape yeah. in the British Museum. You probably, I, I was probably with you. I was that little annoying boy bugging you. Um, and and, and <laughs> Pam, Pam, that lit, that that last that last point we're going to make now is that. 
lots of these bronze axes could not be used because they were too soft. And the idea of actually carrying them is a good one. I, I like that one, that, that sound, thank you. Um, if nobody's got anything else bronze to say- Bronze is not necessarily that soft. That is Because true. when we worked in the vessels at BP, we had to use bronze hammers and chisels to avoid sparks. And uh -huh. using a bronze chisel to, to, to uh, hammer in and get the, uh, the, uh, the build-ups out was, was, was quite difficult. So bronze is not that soft. I mean, it's from building pyramid too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, right. Okay. On that point, on that point about <laughs> building pyramids, um, I got to thank you for all joining us tonight. Hopefully, see most of you tomorrow. Um, and Stav and um, uh, Roz, just stay for just two minutes. Then I've got a dash. So I'm going to say good night to Bill, Pam, Peter, Goff, uh, Pat, uh, um, and Stav. And, and thank you very much. And, and Roz, thank you for joining me tonight. Good night, yeah. 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 night, guys. Cheers. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Night, night. Bye. All right, uh, right. Rosamond the stab. Basically, I'm going to have to dash in about a minute. Right. No problem. But we're, I'm just going to quickly quiet. mention. Um, next week, uh, we'll we'll have 15 minutes where I can do a little bit of young explorer stuff with Stab and uh, Rosamond. That's what we'll do next week. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to have to dash now. Anything All you right, two Carl. would like to say quickly? Really enjoyed that, Carl. It's it's fascinating to see Cymru things you know we see exactly. ancient egypt we see rome exactly we see greece so it's brilliant to stuff. see our own our own stuff our exactly. own stuff and especially as stav and i i don't know the name of the place but it's opposite as this down the bay you know there's the there's the hill it, it's modern chains that have been yeah, made i know but we went yeah. there about six o'clock didn't we stav Good. yeah we were, enjoy it but to think how the chains are made and then you're going back two thousand years and exactly thinking, exactly um, yeah, what the right. guys were saying about partnership. Yes, shut right. up. <laughs> um, yeah, Stab, I really have to go in seconds. So, Stab, anything you... Well, did you enjoy this tonight, Stab? Yeah. Good. All right, then. Right, Stab, the last word tonight, and I'm off. All right, then, that's it. Good, that's a good word. Okay. <laughs> Happy <That's it>. <laughs> <Oil Valor. laughs> And by the way, Stab, your photographs made it in the newsletter, which you should um, get next week. So, um... Oh, which ones are those? Well, we'll ah, wait and see. Uh, that, between me and Stav, thank you very much. You can, it's your oh. surprise. Um, anyway, oh, um, I'm going to thank you for joining us, Stav and Rosamond. If there's nothing else, I am off. Thank you very much, Carl. Another Bye. Bye-bye, you two. Night. Bye. Night-night. Bye. Bye-bye. 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 Love, love, love. Love, 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 love heart, love, love. heart. <laughs> Ta-da! Bye-bye, bye-bye. Trying to...